Well, I had some very inspiring teachers uh, during my public school years. Um, a couple come to mind. Uh, you know, I think the ones that were most inspiring were the ones that were most encouraging. Well, in college, I really liked Aldous Huxley. Um, I wanted to, you know, be like him. Uh, you know, to write in an eloquent manner, uh, to combine, you know, science, philosophy, and religion. Yeah, the most common, you know, two terms, or the ones that have been most common, are hallucinogenic and, you know, psychedelic. Uh, you know, psychedelic means mind manifesting or mind disclosing. Uh, and, you know, hallucinogenic is a little more specific. Uh, it refers, you know, to the hallucinations, which aren't, you know, always the case. I mean, people, uh, you know, do not, you know, always experience, you know, visions or, you know, voices or things like that. And also, I think, you know, hallucination is kind of a loaded term because it refers to, you know, something imaginary that isn't really there. Um, and I think, you know, psychedelic is the most generic um, because um, it can describe an experience where uh, um, where you have, uh, you know, visions and you experience voices uh, or your thinking is disturbed or your thinking is unaffected, uh, where you're happy or you're sad or you're not, you know, feeling anything at all. Uh, you know, because if anything is, you know, the hallmark of the effects of these drugs, it's, it, um, it is, you know, the variability uh, of the experience. Uh, quite a bit can happen or, you know, nothing at all could happen. You know, one of the drawbacks of the pure DMT state uh, is that uh, up until now, it's really only, uh, you know, been available through smoking or uh, the uh, you know, parenteral administration, you know, either intravenously or intramuscularly as an injection. Um, and if it's smoked or injected, <clears throat> It's quite brief, um, you know. So I, I think one thing that's important is to extend and prolong, you know, the DMT experience in order to explore it more carefully. And uh, a few months ago, a you know colleague of mine from Japan, a British you know fellow named Andrew Gallimore, uh, approached me about a, a you know mathematical anest uh, a you know mathematical uh, you know, model for the continuous infusion of a drug, which is, uh, you know, based on the anesthesiology literature, um, you know, where you have to keep, you know, people asleep and, and attain and maintain a steady state of an anesthetic drug. And he applied that, you know, to DMT, you know, based on the half-life and uh, metabolism data that we, you know, generated from the original DMT work. Uh, you know, so hopefully, you know, somebody will, uh, you know, pick up, you know, the challenge and, uh, you know, do that experiment, you know, get, you know, people in, in uh, to a prolonged, you know, DMT state, you know, where you can enter into it and drop out of it and, uh, interact and be interviewed, you know, by the investigators to, you know, characterize the state more carefully. Well, like, you know, for example, establishing, you know, contact, you know, with the beings which are often reported in those states. Uh, you know, most of the time in, you know, my studies, it uh, was quite, you know, difficult to establish uh, a stable, you know, communication, you know, with those beings. Um, you know, the language wasn't quite shared, the anxiety was, you know, too great on the part of the volunteers. And, you know, by the time, you know, communication was established, you know, the effect started fading. Um, you know, so if, if, you know, somebody could spend hours in that state, uh, I think it would be easier to, you know, see what is uh, you know, possible uh, with respect to um, establishing more stable kinds of... Uh, in interactions, you know, with those beings. Um, and this, you know, paper that Andrew Gallimore and I put together on the continuous infusion protocol, um, you know, it's a great opportunity uh, to re-explore the DMT state, which most 
people in the scientific community don't seem especially uh, eager to do. So, uh, you know, it's been 21 years since I've, you know, finished my study. One DMT paper has come out, you know, since then. So, uh, you know, obviously it's a vacuum or it's a niche or it's a, you know, gap or a, you know, void that uh, still needs to be, you know, filled. Uh, so, you know, if, you know, the opportunity arose, if, you know, for example, you know, some department of, you know, psychiatry approached me and said, you know, we would, you know, really, you know, like to do this continuous infusion study, would you come on board and help us design it and implement it? I would, you know, probably um, agree to do it. Well, there's two, you know, ways to get DMT. You know, one is to extract it from plants that contain it. And, uh, you know, the other is to, you know, synthesize it from scratch. If you're extracting DMT from plants, it could be as pure as what is made in a lab, if it's, you know, pure. Um, or, it, you know, could be, you know, contaminated with other, you know, substances, you know, from the extraction process or which are contained in the plants. Uh, and in the, you know, same way, if your, you know, chemist isn't that, you know, good and he's making it or, you know, she's making it in, in a lab, you know, there can be also, you know, some contaminants. You know, so the most important thing is the purity. Um, and if it's not pure, then, you know, what are the impurities um, that you, you know, might be getting? Uh, you know, so what is the, you know, the most um, appropriate, you know, way to take DMT? Uh, what's the best, you know, setting? Uh, well, you know, first you have to establish your set, which is your state of mind and your state of body. And, you know, that has to be as optimal as, you know, possible. Well, you know, uh, in my study, I only coached, you know, people to a, a you know, um, you know, to a, you know, minimal degree. Um, you know, we didn't have incense or, you know, bells or mantras or yoga postures or uh, I didn't hold people's hands, you know, necessarily anyway. I just, you know, told people two things. It's really fast and you may think that you've died. And if you do think you've died, you have, you know, two ways of dealing with that. You know, one is, oh, oh shit, I've died, and, you know, get me out of here. Or the other is, okay, I've died. You know, this is very interesting. You know, what do I do next? You know, what is this like? And you, you know, continue forward. Well, you know, one of the most important elements from the volunteers' reports were their conviction that, they were being, you know, shown things, you know, that it was the, you know, revelation of a freestanding external reality. You know, so at a certain point, I kind of, you know, decided, you know, to do a, you know, thought experiment and, you know, and to, you know, take at face, you know, value that what they were apprehending in that state was, you know, something completely independent of them. It was like, an invisible, you know, world which all of a sudden became, you know, visible. And it, you know, was not being, you know, generated in their brain, but as a result of the DMT, their, you know, consciousness was, you know, now able to perceive it. You know, so I began thinking, well, if so, then, you know, so what? You know, so what that we can enter into these states? You know, what are they good for? Are we any smarter, wiser, kinder, more compassionate? You know, so after I completed my studies, uh, I started to, you know, look for, you know, models which could, you know, possibly explain how DMT could be providing access to externally real objective, you know, levels of, uh, of reality, uh, which otherwise, you know, weren't visible. You know, so I started, you know, looking at, uh, you know, notions of dark matter and, you know, parallel universes, uh, which I think in, you know, some ways are useful mechanistic, you know, constructs uh, in the, you know, sense, you know, that perhaps, you know, DMT through its, you know, modifying brain chemistry is also, you know, modifying, you know, the receiving characteristics of the mind-brain complex. Yeah, you know, and uh, I just kind of, you know, became entranced and enchanted with the, you know, material in the Bible. 
you know, it was, you know, pleasurable to re encounter the spiritual, you know, tradition of, you know, um, of my you know, childhood, um, of my race, um, you know, but also, you know, finally I was, you know, beginning, you know, to get an inkling of a, you know, model of spirituality which comported with the reports of my DMT volunteers, which was the you know, prophetic state, which was you know similar or more you know similar to reports of you know my volunteers you know than were the Eastern religious models or even you know the shamanic models, um, and you know so that then you know led me to you know start developing the you know theories which uh, I present and and, you know, write about in my, uh, you know, book, you know, The Soul of Prophecy. You know, so I like to, you know, think of the stories in the Bible as if they were true. You know, kind of like I approached the DMT reports. Um, if I, you know, looked at them as completely real, I would, you know, get into some trouble. If I looked at them as completely imaginary, I would get into trouble. You know, so I approach them as if, you know, they were real. And then uh, that allowed me the scaffolding to, you know, drill into the experiences. I think the most important thing which you, you know, touched upon is the, the whole issue of the nature and the existence of God. You really aren't able to, you know, read the Hebrew Bible without encountering its description, its, you know, notion of God, like um, in the third, the you know, third word in the Hebrew Bible is God, um, Elohim. You know, so, you know, in the beginning of God creating, you know, the heavens and the earth. And, you know, for most, uh, you know, secular educated Westerners, you know, that's enough to stop them in their tracks. They say, forget it. And they close the book and, you know, that's it. You know, who is, is, you know, God who made the heavens and the earth? You know, but if you uh, can stick, you know, with it, which is, you know, one of the, the important things that I learned, you know, from, you know, my Buddhist, you know, practice is, uh, you know, if you can't understand, you know, something, if encountering, you know, something makes you anxious or is, you know, cognitively uh, impossible, you know, to grasp, then just, you know, carry on, uh, just, you know, continue and, you know, see what happens. Um, and I think once you're entering into the world being described there, you begin to, you know, tap in to the state of mind out of which emerged that text, which is a prophetic state. It's a, you know, mild prophetic state, albeit, but, uh, if you, you know, think about, you know, the text as written about prophetic experience, which is any spiritual state described in the text, which means um, encounters with, you know, God, any inspiration, any visions or any voices. So I've, you know, developed a, you know, a you know, model which is kind of a, you know, top-down model, you know, theoneurology. Uh, which, you know, proposes that, you know, God, you know, designed the brain in, you know, such a way as to provide communication with us. And, and you know, DMT, you know, could, uh, you know, possibly, uh, you know, serve as a, you know, mediator for certain, uh, you know, features of spiritual experience, um, in you know, particular, the um well the phenomenological uh, you know contents of spiritual experience you know the visions and uh, the voices you could look at ayahuasca or the spirit of ayahuasca as a mediator between you know god and you and that you know mediator is what the you know bible you refers to um as an angel uh, you know so I, I think where people get, you know, hung up, at least from, you know, my point of view, is, you know, is, you know, the shamanic model, it, it kind of stops with the spirits, it kind of stops with the angels, and the spirit of ayahuasca is prayed to and is, you know, worshipped, is, 
you know, deified in a way. And uh, one, you know, thing that the Bible is always, you know, pointing out is, you know, is, you know, that the angels are only intermediaries between God and humans because, you know, God is, you know, normally incomprehensible and visible. You know, there's a couple of elements regarding the properties of DMT that I think would um, would qualify would qualify it as the endo matrix, um, as it were. Uh, you know, DMT is transported into the brain uh, using energy across the blood-brain barrier, and the brain only does that with respect to necessary components like sugar, amino acids that it's not able to make on its own. You know, so it's as if the you know, brain requires DMT for normal function, uh, which is a strange concept. Uh, I mean, also within the last few years, uh, it's been discovered that the DMT synthesizing apparatus is active in the retina. You know, so it you know could be that you know DMT is the endomatrix. It is the interface, which is you know kind of uh, responsible you know for our encounter with what we call uh, you know consensus reality.